So good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. You know, it's, it's a privilege this morning to have uh, uh, a very, very smart, entrepreneurial, uh, successful operator joining us. And uh, you already have a shout out from Matt Winstead, just as we're, we're getting going here. <laughs> gotcha. Hi, Matt. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, as my guest, uh, Jim Caruso. Jim and his brother run Ottawa Dental Labs, uh, really based out of Illinois, but covering uh, an expanded territory is the best I can describe it. And uh, I'll let uh, Jim talk about himself and his business a bit. So morning, Jim, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Happy all of you are on today. So my name's Jim Caruso and I'm the president and owner of Ottawa Dental Lab with my brother, Luke Caruso. Um, so I key more on the business side, sales and marketing, um, and he focuses a lot of his attention on the operations side. So um, it's a nice combination and it's worked well. Uh, we've been in running the lab for about 10 years now. Uh, we're a third generation family owned business. Uh, we were started in 1937 by my grandfather, Tony Crusoe. So this year will be our 84th year in business. Um, and we've always focused on our local area. Um, so we started in Ottawa and then we decided that pickup and delivery would be something we wanted to offer. And through pickup and delivery, we've been able to expand throughout the state of Illinois. And then as we've grown, we also have done some acquisitions. So currently we have five labs. Um, we have our home base in Ottawa where we have both an analog lab and then recently, this, uh, just in June, we built a digital lab. Um, so we've worked out of two different laboratories here um, based on the workflow. And then we have locations in Chicago, Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois, and then South Bend, Indiana. Um, so currently out of all of our locations, we operate with about 225 people on staff. It's a good sized business. And uh, aside from that, uh, as much as you're building a lab, you've also uh, got four kids. Yes. So my wife and I have four kids. We got uh, our oldest is an eight-year-old daughter. We have twin boys that just turned six. And so having them at home and homeschooling has definitely been a challenge. Definitely much harder on my wife since I'm still working. Um, but I think it's a whole new appreciation for teachers in this world, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And uh, how how's it feel to be working with your brother, Luke? You know? Yeah, I mean, so obviously we've grown up together. And, you know, as brothers, you always have your good years and bad years. And then in, we actually when he's only a year older than I am. So he went to the University of Iowa. And I was actually looking to go to the University of Kentucky. And he persuaded me to go to... Iowa, which was surprising to me because I didn't think you'd want me anywhere near them. Um, and ever since then, it's uh, we've been best friends. And honestly, it's we have two different areas we focus on. And surprisingly, I can say we maybe once or twice have ever left work disappointed at each other. Um, so we've really been able to build the trust in each other. And I think him being your brother, you always know he has the best interest for you, even though you might not agree with the decision. Um, if there's ever times we don't agree, we get on the whiteboard and leave the room with a agreement that we're and even if you're not agree with, you're gonna support it. Uh, I hope Luke's on because then I can ask him to to uh, message us on chat and tell me if uh, if Jim's guessing us on this. <laughs> oh, it really does work better than most would think. <laughs> so I mean, uh, share with us a bit, and I'm I'm trying to. To move forward from, you know, we're in the muck now, uh, in the sense that we've had this shutdown. Tell me what you've been doing, if you don't mind, while uh, we're in the situation of, uh, uh, you know, essentially a lockdown in dental. Yeah, so obviously we've been affected just like everybody else. Um, Illinois was the third state to close down, so we saw it a little bit earlier. And then overnight, you saw it go from 100% of your capacity to 80 to 60. And now we're at, by the end of that week, we're at about 10%. Now we're at about anywhere from 6 to 8% of our normal 
workflow coming in. So we made decision early and furloughed majority of our staff. Um, even as of last week, we were only working with 13 people. Uh, today we are up to 30. Um, so we do feel that there is going to start seeing some ramp up. Uh, Illinois looks to be, we're just waiting for the official word, but it looks like May 4th will allow dentists to go back to work. Um, so we're ramping up, um, but in the meantime, we did work on some projects. We kind of looked at it in a couple different areas, our sales and marketing, what new products could we possibly bring? Um, like many others, we started doing some PPE gear, um, some mass fitters, shields, and really marketed them to the dental community as well, knowing that they're going to need this. And it seems like Absolutely. they're going to be the ones having a harder time even than um, the hospitals just based on the fact that they've never ordered this stuff in the past so their suppliers don't have them on the list to be able to get them so we're really focusing we did some for hospitals and that but now we're focusing on making sure that our dental offices have the proper PPE even to the extent of trying to find them face um, even finding them a mask and gloves if they need them and because sometimes we have different avenues we can purchase in based on our size that they weren't so we're just getting them and reselling them at cost to the the offices um, we also you know are just really looking at things that we never do when we're super busy uh, so for our sales reps they don't ever you know it's always nice to upgrade your samples so we've been working on some sample cases some photography um, on the operations ends we just really fine-tuned our SOPs we looked at also just different materials and you know like everybody we like to test new products but it's kind of you never give a true test when you're trying to do it in your production level so we really looked at different materials that we're using and during this time we're going to be switching two of our most commonly used materials I'm sure a lot of you can guess what those are um, but that's just based on having the right time to give it a full out test and do enough units to really feel comfortable with it I mean, perfect time to negotiate and talk with your vendors. Uh, they have as much time as we do these days. Um, so, I mean, this is a time, and if I think, just look at uh, how you can improve your overall cost of goods sold, and a lot of times that's coming by your supply cost. So, whether it's having to switch products and test it, or else just having a conversation with your um, vendors and seeing if they can help you in any way. So, we've done that, and then on the finance end, like everybody, we're just trying to make sure we have enough capital for when we do come out of here. We got the PPP loan just like everybody else. Um, I don't think it's, a, I mean, obviously it's a nice thing to have. I don't think it fits our industry that well, being the fact that we're all not working or we're bringing people back just to bring them back. So, I mean, we're looking at how to use it as much as possible on staffing but also looking at it as whatever money we don't use how do we use that capital to invest in our company at a one percent over two year cost and i think that's an area that's not getting looked at a lot by companies and i think it's probably the only time that you're going to have such a nice offer from banks without collateral yeah, yeah and uh, we all have to remember that ppp money we got to pay back at some point correct so it is a it is a loan. Uh, just to give us an idea of the types of lab labs that are on the show, uh, I'd like to ask our, our evident team to just put up a poll just to give us an idea of what sizes of labs uh, are, are watching us so we can more or less cater some of the, the comments or discussions to, to what works for them. So if you guys don't mind just filling in the poll and uh, that way it gives us some guidance on what to do as we answer these questions. So uh, aside from this, you know, I, 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 previous to, to this show, Jim and I had a, a discussion and uh, there were a lot of things they're doing at Ottawa that I found very impressive. And certainly I've, I've spoken with hundreds of labs through my career and there's, there's always a standout. I think every lab, has some uniqueness to it that, that make them special. And one of the things that, that I've found really unique uh, in, in the case of Ottawa Labs is your logistics program. I mean, you guys are like an Amazon. And, <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to, if you don't mind, just, just sharing with us what that is. Oh, and we got a fair bit of uh, different sizes. You know? Gives you an idea if 
uh, I don't know if everyone can see the poll and what sizes the labs are. We've got 27% under five, 39% uh, under 35, you know, 18% under 100 and 15% over 100. So some big labs listening in on the show. Yeah, so um, logistics is a huge part of the success of our lab. Um, all the way back when my grandfather started in Ottawa, Illinois, is a town of about 18,000 people, and we're about 90 miles southwest of Chicago. So we don't have a whole lot of big cities to draw from that aren't at least about 45 minutes to an hour away. Um, and when we first started, we were just working for local doctors. And then my grandfather saw a bread truck and he said, if you can deliver bread for that you're selling for five cents, why can't I deliver dental products? So at that point, we started our first route and we started going to a town called Juliet and we saw our lab triple at that time just because of the amount of dentists is there. So we really kept that model that started, you know, 80 years ago and really just continued to expand that. And we felt, feel um, our company is set up for success if we actually do the pickup and delivery of our products ourselves, We feel that's an added value that really brings um, nice um, revenue our way and allows our sales reps to have a story to tell. Um, and it, to us, it allows us to try to eliminate the outside competitors that maybe are, you know, you're having to put in a um, ship the box to UPS. So over time, we just continue to add routes. Um, and currently, we now have 22 routes in place that service a little over 5,000 miles a day. Wow. And what we did, and that's how we come up with our acquisitions and our startups as well. Um, when we get to a point where, hey, we can only drive two hours away from the lab and get back in a timely manner, um, let's get to that furthest edge, say it's Chicago. We can get to Chicago and back, but we can't go any further if we want to go north. Well, then we did a startup in Chicago, which now lets us go another two hours north of Chicago. Um, just like from Ottawa, we can hit northwest Indiana, uh, but that's about as far as we could go. So when we were able to acquire a lab in South Bend, Indiana, now it allowed us to cover about 200 miles south of South Bend, that met up perfectly where our Ottawa driver ends. And then we also now cover about 200 miles in Southern Michigan. Um, so in that story, Southern Michigan will be an area that we're looking for an acquisition to be able to cover the rest of Michigan. Um, right now we also, we get to the Wisconsin border, the Iowa border. Um, so those are areas we're looking for acquisition is to be able to grow in Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois. Um, but we've always just kind of looked at our growth opportunity through logistics and it really allows us to turn around our product quicker. Um, we shoot for no more than five day turnarounds um, as of added value, but we're also able to get it, start the case that night and deliver it um, the day it's finished. So with that, my routes usually get back at about 4.30 and I have about 10 people that work from 4.30 to about 10 that come in and do all the data entry for all the cases we picked up. That way at 4 a.m. when my model team comes, they have the full day of work already. So it helps us eliminate a day. Um, and currently we pick up about 95% of our work. And you're kind of like the, the railroad. When you hit the end of the line, you're looking for acquisitions to expand your line to the next stage. And the next exactly. The next and I think it really allows us just to add better customer service because we can really control our own drivers, right? You can't control UPS. Um, when UPS makes a mistake or they're late, there's no, you can call a hundred times and there's nothing you can do. I can do special routes. When a doctor calls into me, I know exactly how far away that my driver is. So we have GPS tracking on all of our drivers. So we know exactly where they're at at all times. So when a doctor calls in, we can give them accurate information to go on. Yeah. And Matt is asking, uh, you know, why you chose to go this way? Is it cost savings versus FedEx or is it because it's a better overall customer experience? I'm uh, it's a combination. Um, so when you look at the overall cost, we are able to come in under on all but two routes under what it would cost me to UPS that that case. And I think 
more so, it just allows us to always every day have a person in that person's, in the doctor's practices. I use all my own drivers, so they're all uniform, they're well-trained, I can use them for marketing, handing out different literature. But I mean, overall, we've been able to do our deliveries, you know, anywhere right around five to six dollars per package. And a, a question from David, I think you're going to get asked a lot of questions here, Jim. So uh, I'm glad you grabbed a, a bottle of water before <laughs> we started. <laughs> what, what percentage, uh, this is from David Lesh, what, uh, what percentage of your, in, of your income is related to delivery? I'm thinking what percentage of, of revenue is, is delivery cost? The average delivery cost right now is about 5% of our, our costs. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and Ray, thanks for saying good morning. You know, we're, we're getting uh, questions coming in now. And uh, I've got to figure out how to answer it and talk to you. So I'm definitely multitasking. Um, let's touch on, the, on a couple of points we've, we've had the chat about. Uh, let's talk about China. You know, yeah. You've done a great job of competing in a tough market. You've got, you know, high-end work, mid-end work. You've got DSO work. Uh, how do you do that? Like, what's your philosophy regarding competition and, and, you know, essentially the lab industry in general? Well, I think there's competition everywhere we look. I mean, no matter where you're looking, no matter what industry, it's competition. And I don't think we can look to sit here and control where our competition is. So I've never looked at China as a, any different than any competition in the United States. Um, I know that everybody, you can sell stuff for high prices and low prices. And I think that value adds come with the low and the high, right? And so I think we can all say our own opinion on what we feel about China, but they're gonna be probably our lowest price competitors. So what we've done is we know the marketplace that really is using China the most not all is a lot of the DSO practices. Um, and when we were looking at it, we wanted to become a player in the DSO game. And we realized China was going to be a competitor, as is other big labs in the United States. Um, so we wanted to really take a look at it and say, okay, we need to be on full zirconia crowns in order to get their attention. Can we do that in the United States? And the answer was yes. And uh, Part of why we built our new facility back in June was strictly to answer that question. Um, we were outgrowing our existing building, but we also realized if we want to be a player in the DSO market and compete against China, we have to really be able to control our overall cost of making the product. Um, so when we, what we decided to do is we would separate our digital and our analog um, and at the same time, we would build teams and only certain team members are allowed to work on DSO work. And that's based on, you know, years of experience, wages, all of that, um, to be able to keep our costs down. So we built a 16,000 square foot facility here. We have about 75 technicians in this building currently. Wow. Um, out of those 75 technicians, there's only five that have over two, two years of dental lab experience. And we're producing about 150 crowns a day out of here. Um, so it was just really needing to beef up our training. We brought in, now we have three full-time trainers. So we have kind of a school teacher training that's teaching terminology in that. We have a digital trainer and an analog trainer. And it's really helped us um, be able to, over, over time, reduce the cost, it, uh, reduce the cost that it um, takes on to make a crown. Um, also, with the volume, it's allowed us to get better pricing on our materials as well. But at the end of the day, we were able to find an equation that really worked and still kept you in a, a comfortable gross profit area that I think anybody would be willing to do these at. So I think it's more just instead of worrying about the competition, worry about our own four walls and what can we do inside those four walls to make us competitors. And I always looked at if I can't do it for a reasonable price, the people that are using China aren't going to want to use me anyway. They're going to use the second lowest price person in the U.S., not somebody at a high price. So that's kind of how we've always looked at it. And usually, as long as you can, with DSOs, if you can get them on their core prices, I mean, you're going to get the rest of the work to it where you don't have to discount the work as much as you do on, say, a zirconia crown. 
Yeah. And, and just to clarify, you have 75 techs in that, in that building, but you've got over, you know, 200 techs all over yeah. and you're yeah. getting hundreds of crowns a day. So Christian Hall was just asking for a clarification of, I think he was pooping his pants, 75 techs and 150 crowns a day was his math. And, uh, that, you know, that, that, I mean, I know firsthand yeah. hundreds of units a day. They, yeah. That's just strictly <laughs> DSO units. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're also doing all of our preliminary posterior. So kind of what we do is our, this lab will also take on all our full pain posterior crowns and then our anterior crowns go to higher level people. And as I mentioned to you before the show, I've met a lot of lab owners and even I myself, when, when I had the lab group, uh, I was telling you the story that at one point I had 120 delivery cars driving yeah. around uh, all over the United States and every week someone would get into a car accident and so on and so forth. And uh, one day my CFO came in and said, you know, here's our insurance bill. And it was over a hundred thousand dollars. And I, 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 I lost it. I went, Oh my goodness. Uh, and there's the reason I brought that up is there's a lot of questions coming up on my screens about do you own or lease the fleet or, you know, do you let people drive two hours away or do you do relines? And I, I'm just going to guide the answer a bit into one answer, which is what I've seen you do that I haven't seen too many other people do is create an extensive logistics system where you can track every car, you know the most efficient way to get them from one place or another. So it's not one, it's not about the car, it's not about the driver, it's about the software you put in place and the tracking systems that you put in place. Uh, do you want to touch on that? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, so we use a software, it's called GoFleet. So our drivers usually run about, it's about 80% the same route every day because we have people that are everyday pickups and then you have people that come and go. Um, we actually staff it. It's all part-time drivers. Most of them are retired from their previous job. And part of why we do the part-time is if one calls off, we have another driver waiting to go. Um, that way it doesn't interrupt our you know, daily activities. Um, all our drivers know at least three or four routes. So it allows us to really be able to always know that we have drivers available. Um, and then we do every quarter, we'll look at all, each specific route and just review the routes. Um, you know, as we've added new accounts, do we need to shift any? And we kind of have systems in place to know when we need to add another route based on overall how long it's taking the route to be driven. Um, so our routes, usually we leave our lab at 930 and they're back around five. Got it. Um, but I mean, yeah, so it, another thing it allows us, even though the patient, the doctor might be 150 miles away, we can do overnight relines, repairs, and that kind of stuff with them because we'll open our lab up at about four o'clock. We open at four to be able to start the model work and also for removables to do any um, relines, repairs, or any simple adjustments in Crown and Bridge, anything like that. So we can try to meet the needs of our customer quicker. And that's just another way we feel it allows us to keep some outside competitors into their offices. Well, I, I can tell, Jim, you're getting a ton of questions here. So you're a popular guy. And uh, I, I think it's a, it's a testament to how people view your operations and how, how I mean, frankly, how impressive they are. I think you personally, okay. I think you've done a, a, a great job at it. Uh, a couple of things that jump out at me. You know, number one, one of the questions is how are you collecting your receivables? You know, as you've got people dabbling, you've got 30 people showing up at work. I mean, sometimes having a, a skeleton staff costs you more money. As, as things yeah. go. So, I mean, how are you managing that whole situation? And then I'm collecting receivables. I mean, I think a lot of it's relationship driven as well. Um, we've always done a pretty good job at keeping a you know, a finger pressed on our accounts that owe us money. Um, but we were talking earlier, I've had a few people that got into us decently. Um, and we've just been proactively calling out, you know, who owes us the most and going down the list. And surprisingly, we've actually seen a better response than I would think from some of the people that owe us 
the most. I think some of the PPP monies helped out. Uh, they have a little bit more confidence than they did previous. So I think we've seen some of their money from their PPP go to us kind of as a short-term loan. They're looking at their PPP as, because I think just like I said earlier, I don't feel all of us really think most of it's going to be forgiven uh, because you don't have enough work to bring everyone back. So I think hitting them now is a good time to do it. We've also looked at it a little differently. Instead of just having the normal people that call and collect, it's been myself, my VP of finance, my brother. So kind of a little bit um, people I think that it's harder to say no to. Yeah. Um, or at least they feel like, okay, now this is important. And I think people understand and don't take it the wrong way when you're calling because they know everybody knows right now cash is king and we all need it. And the ones that can, I'm making accounts, anybody that's, you know, pushing, say, 60 days, let's, we're going to put them on COD um, during this time until we feel comfortable that they can pay off what they owe us in the past. We're not going to push customers away, but at the same time, now is not a time we can do work that we get paid in 120 days from now because we have our obligation to pay our people and as a company i'm really we're trying our best to make sure we're doing all of our accounts payable because if we're sitting here trying to collect and that we should also then live up to our side and pay our bills yeah and i think that's a great example to to show the world that look you know it's really uh, to use the term you know, it's a cascading effect that if one stops doing it, the people down the line really get affected. I mean, we, we've got a few other questions. One thing I wanted to touch on is every time we, we do a show, uh, there's always someone with a one-man lab, two-man lab, three-man lab, or five-man lab that says, you know, what you're talking about doesn't apply to me. And... Any comments on that? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Now I'll, I'll give my personal thought on it as well. No, I think every lab's been a, the one person, the two person, the three person. And I mean, obviously there's different scales of different labs in this that are on this today. There's some smaller, some bigger than us. Um, but the whole practice of this is all the same for all of us, in my opinion. We all need to get paid. We all need to pay people. Um, I mean, some it hurts more to lose one person than it does the other but the bigger you are the more opportunity you have to lose many or you have more money sitting out there um but i don't feel there's really anything different i think we all need to be practicing the same thing and uh, if you're a one person lab or a thousand person lab because at the end of the day that's how it's we're all going to get out of this yeah and and i'm in exactly the same page as you that uh, i started with a four-man lab yeah. And, you know, as we grew, we went through the same challenges as everyone else. So uh, a comment back, and I was, I was sharing with Jim that sometimes after the shows, I get hate mail from <laughs> a smaller lab saying, you didn't do anything for us. Uh, and I, I think to myself, well, we're sharing the secrets to growing a lab. And I think the option is up to everyone, whether they want to to turn their lab into a business or into uh, maintain something more of a handicraft operation. And those are just two separate things. You know, yeah. our focus is to give people the tools and maybe open people's minds to uh, give them an idea on how people grow their businesses or turn their labs into scalable businesses. And my, my caution to the smaller operators is this, you know, when I started in the lab business, the key challenge was getting the coefficient of expansion between metal and porcelain to fuse together. And everyone was an artist because it was a challenge to get two different materials to go fuse together. And there was a lot of artistic talent and skill uh, involved in that. The world's changing a bit and the customers are changing a lot. And my caution to people is, you know, as, as much as uh, the past has gotten us to where we got to today, adapting to the future, it's also an important aspect to, to position ourselves uh, to be able to thrive. So anyway, uh, 
that's my point. And uh, uh, Dwayne, I appreciate the the uh, comment on uh, you appreciate the evident platform. I mean, we service everyone, but I got to tell you, sometimes it's really disheartening when you get uh, emails from one man lab saying, why aren't you doing anything for us? And uh, my response is we are, and you just have to listen. So a uh, couple of other questions here. Man, you got a lot of questions. Uh, Good thing we have a lot of time these days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, I'll need a few seconds to, to uh, uh, consolidate all of this. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll run a, uh, we're testing out the video and uh, I'm asking as a favor to everyone here, I'm going to ask our, our evident crew to go play a video and just tell us, give us an idea of how you feel about this video before we use it. That's a great focus group. It'll take 30 seconds and it'll buy me 30 seconds to go put all these questions together because uh, we, we got them coming from all over. So uh, for the evident team, do you mind queuing up that video as I read these things? Okay, I think they're, they're going to ask a, a quick poll after that video, but the questions that we've got really fall under three categories here. Uh, number one, oh, he, first, this, does the video make you want to learn more about improving your lab business? Is the question. You know, yes, no, don't care. So any feedback is much appreciated. Uh, Jim, the, the questions that have been posted to you uh, rely on number one, what's your target cost of goods percentage? I don't know if you want to share that or not, but you know, more in line with profitability numbers. I always say if you're a private company, you don't have to share it, but uh, it's up to you. Uh, I mean, gross income, we, we always want the gross number to be in that 45 to 48%. Okay. Well, hopefully that answers a, a general question because it ties into a question someone posted at me, which is I've, I've owned a lot of labs in the past. How do you make them grow profitably? And I, I think I've repeated that answer time and time again. After a certain point, how do you take uh, the skill sets or the, the experiences of a small group of people and put systems in place to scale it up. That's really the only way to grow the lab business. And, you know, in my history, I, I shared this with Jim, you know, we look at north of a 30% EBITDA for laboratories. And you do that by running a lab where you're trying to avoid the ups and downs of volume. You know, if you can steady your volume so that it's X number of dollars or units every single day, day in, day out, you know, 221 days a year, then that helps your profitability immensely. I've seen a lot of labs do the, the seesaw where one day they'll get, pick a number, 100 units, another day they'll get 40 units and their production goes up and down and it, it kills your profitability. Uh, I know one of the, the toughest things right now for many lab owners is us you start, and I think you're going through that situation as well, Jim, is, you know, you bring 30 people in, but you don't really have enough units to do it prof profitably yet, and you don't know when they're coming. So, you know, that's the seesaw effect where you, you take a hit. I mean, no, definitely. Right now, we're trying to control how much money we're going to lose in this month, um, yeah. not how much money we're going to make. Um, and But you also have to have the long term of, you know, making sure people are going to be coming back to your laboratory. So how long can 
you know, hold out. But I do think, I mean, just looking at where do we feel the, the when do we feel the work's going to come in or kind of know how that's going to go. I mean, I think we feel it's going to be a little slower than maybe people I've seen on other webcasts and that. Um, our, it sounds like we're May 4th is going to be able to be where Illinois can come back, Indiana as well. Um, but I feel just in talking to our customers, some aren't coming back yet. Uh, some are only going to be seeding crowns, but not prepping. Uh, some are coming back with no hygiene. So a lot of times they find the crowns during hygiene. Um, so that's a concern of ours. I feel that, I mean, the next month or two, we might see 25, 20, 25% of our normal workload uh, get to about 50% um, three, four months from now. I really think it's going to be an effect of, you know, 12 to 18 months till we get back to normal. Uh, I really think to where you can feel you're at 100 percent again. Uh, I think by the end of this year, maybe might be great if we're at 75 percent. Um, I'm hoping I'm wrong, uh, but just looking at how these other countries are doing that have been back earlier, things like that, I think we have to be realistic. Um, and I think when we're planning, we have to be realistic. The last thing in my mind you want to do is over project this and think oh we're going to be busy here and then put yourself in the same situation we all were in you know two months ago where we have too many employees not enough work and now we have to go re retool again i so to say i would rather go on a more conservative pace and bring back as needed um just to be fair to everybody yeah i think a lot of people are glossing over the fact that the most expensive part is when you start back up and now yeah. you got to pay all your overheads and your labor, but you don't have the volume coming in yet. And yeah, I mean, for us, the way we do it is um, our billing and that is, so if we come back May, they'll get their bill June 1st, they get till June 30th. So we'll be paying eight weeks of labor before our first payments are due. Yeah. I mean, well, the, as, a, as, as a heads up, we've got uh, a lot of laboratories phoning us, and setting up systems payable either every two weeks so that uh, they've talked to their dentist and are running their cards through every two weeks. You know, yeah, that's a great idea. FYI. Uh, Ali from Shaw Lab, uh, what's the benchmark for receivables as a percentage of annual sales in, in the lab industry? So, so what percent are we shooting to collect? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I guess what percentage of receivables do you carry? You know, if you're doing, let's say, $10 million a year, you know, do you carry $2 million in receivables at any one time? Uh, I mean, if you're doing $10 million a year, I think I would be shooting for about a 10%. Yeah. You're going to be looking at one month of receivables, obviously, for the work that they did. And then you're also going to have then your 30, 60, 90 day pass due. Uh, I think 10% is even generous. Yeah, I look at it in terms of how often do you turn your, your receivables and I look at 14 days. So that means, you know, you're under 10%. Yeah, we, so get a net 30, we get a net 30 and our average is about 16 days. Yeah, so... And then what's your biggest challenge as you uh, open back up? I think the biggest challenge is just timing, uh, making the right decisions on when to bring different areas of your laboratory back, um, making sure that you have work for people to do um, while they're here. Um, so I think for us, it's just timing. Also, we're, as we said, one of the things we're strong at is logistics. That's going to be a challenge for us now. I mean, not every office is going to want drivers walking through the front door. Uh, so I have my sales rep right now is in here. We brought them back and they're doing more inside sales, calling uh, existing customers today and throughout this next couple of weeks, just, hey, what's your new protocol for us? Would, do you want to be a UPS customer for the short term? Do you want us to come in? If we come in, do you prefer us to come in the back door, the front door? You want us to call and you'll bring us the case. So we're going to go, um, we're calling each customer. So we do about 800 
pick up their deliveries a day, different offices. So we're calling each of them to get each of their protocol and, you know, document and put it in our system so we can properly serve them. The last thing we want to do is, you know, they're doing some, have a new practice for their office and then we're the one that storm in and blow their new <laughs> disinfecting protocol or whatever it is you know a lot of them are going to one person a waiting room i doubt they want it to be the lab yeah fair so, enough yeah or, i mean that's for us logistics is good i mean that it's a strength but it's going to be one of our challenges too yeah although again i mean just the fact that you're calling your clients up and understanding what their protocol is going to be yeah and i mean with it's a big this, deal. And our reps, so our reps are also calling, asking, letting them know, hey, we can, do you need shields? Do you need mask fitters? So we're also able to offer a service that they probably didn't expect us to offer. So I think that really helps us build the relationship with them. I'm amazed too, just how many dentists that don't work with us are calling about this type of gear. Um, so it's a nice way for us to build new relationships as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if I'm a lab, I, I would be looking at how do I produce or sell PPEs to my to my clients, right? Because they're going to need it. And uh, we've got another question from Amit. You know, which lab software do you recommend? I'm going to answer that, Jim. It has to be evident, Amit. <laughs> and then uh, I, I think you've, you've answered the, how are you planning and opening your business up? Uh, he was asking, do you pay your employees by the hour when they come back? Yeah, so ma majority of our employees are hourly, um, so we'll be paying them their normal pay hourly, and then all of our salary employees will be on salary. So management and above is mainly on salary, and the hourly employees will still be paid hourly. And uh, uh, there's a few more here. Uh, I'm just... There's so much popping up on my screens, Jim. I'm, it's taking me a bit. How do you QA and QC some products in group shifts? Is that challenging? The quality control. Um, I mean, the thing is, is even if you're in groups, I mean, most of the time, just for us, what we'll do is we have different levels of QC. We have pre QCers, so that's people that QC before anything hits an oven. And then we have final QC here. So for us, we'll just, we have enough of them that we'll stagger them throughout different shifts. Um, we usually, for us, that's a person that's been promoted into that position. So part of the promotion might be, hey, your hours are gonna change because you're gonna now uh, cover, be doing the quality control for the evening group or the day group, morning group. But majority of it, we have multiple people that can do that. So, and uh, th there's a general uh, theme to questions, which is what, you know, whether it's what car lease are you doing or how do you approach a lab or, you know, there's a lot of snippets, but I think I can summarize it and you can comment to me whether you agree with, not, with it or not. One of the things that I see with uh, labs such as yourself and with a lot of our successful guests on this show is it's not one thing, it's everything. Right? It's taking a look at the business of making teeth and interacting with customers and fine tuning every single touch point so that you get it right. Is that fair to say? That is, and actually just last year our company internally and externally we came up with what we call the ODL way and it's the proven process of doing business with our company so our sales team gives it to the doctors and we also show every new hire everybody we look at it there's about eight different categories and it kind of walks a case through from all the way from the discovery point of sales and marketing to the final or to the seating of the doctor so in there you have you know, pickup and delivery, the production, and under there, gives four or five different examples of each to like how you, what makes us really good at that. And to me, I just everybody in my company at least falls into one of those categories. And if we miss up on any of those eight steps, we're not going to give the customer the ODL way. So it really just shows everybody has the importance in this company, whether you're a driver. You know, even a receptionist, if you don't answer on time or you forget to call that pickup out, 
we just blew the case and maybe lost a doctor all the way, you know, to the people that are doing it, to the QC people. Um, and then lastly, it's just making sure we're giving the doctor a, a product that the patient can leave smiling about. So yeah, we have a full out proven process that really we can show people where they're at in that process and what, uh, why their position's important to the overall experience. And then uh, a common question here is, how do you approach dental labs or dental dentists for new business? Whether it's a single dentist, multiple dentist, DSO? Uh, so, I mean, there's different approaches. So we have um, usually anywhere from three to four outside sales reps. So they're seeing anywhere from 15 to 20 new offices, just cold calling, walking in um, and, you know, meeting with the staff usually it's you know like any sales takes you five or six visits to get comfortable with the staff and then you get your opportunity to the doctor to show our portfolio and what we do we offer lunch and learns with existing and non-existing customers whether it's on our products whether it's on services or we teach there's times we teach people that don't use us how to pour a model and obviously that helps build a relationship with us um, we have some inside sales, so they're calling out, doing touches with all of our customers. Uh, DSOs, um, usually that's handled with my brother and myself. Um, sometimes the leads will come from our sales rep, but at that point, you have to be ready to be able to have answers quickly. You get one shot a lot of times with DSOs, so just making sure the right people are in the right meetings. Um, and, you know, as we've grown over time, my brother and myself do have the availability at times to be able to go and co-travel with our sales reps to where, hey, bring me to the five people you think we can close today. And that's what, how we'll spend our time wisely. But a lot of it's just persistence, uh, sending out mailers, having your drivers drop off stuff as they drive by offices we don't go to. That's another area where our logistics help. Say hey, anytime my off driver drives by, they can drop off something and Sometimes you get a new account strictly from maybe the lab had a bad case that day, so the doctor is willing to change. I mean, I think that's the thing of our industry is you have to be in there regularly because they can tell you no, but the one day that the crown didn't fit in the morning, they're going to tell you yes. And I mean, we have people that are selling against us and we do the same and it's just kind of the law of average in my opinion. Yeah, I've always said the best thing for a lab to be able to do is be the best second choice. Because yeah. you know, the first choice will always screw up. I, I have, you have, we all do. And yeah, and I, I think, I mean, with the, the product mix is changing, right? And I think more and more, a lot of what we do are coming almost more commodities in certain areas, certain products. And then there's other products that are still high end. Um, but I think now it's really depends on, you know, what other added services, your turnaround times, what kind of value adds can you add? Because I think everyone on here probably can say they do a nice product. And everyone I go against to in my market, they make nice products. So everybody makes good products. We all make good products. But we all make mistakes and botch a case here and there or misdeliver a case. And that's when... If somebody calls on my doctor, that's when I'm probably going to lose my doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it's when I make a mistake. And I mean, we all do it. So I think it's just being consistent, not sporadic. Make sure if you're going to do sales calls, make sure you're consistently doing them. Make sure you're following up, not just I'll go once every couple of months because that's not going to get you anywhere. And uh, I, I have to jump in here because someone was a. Uh applying for a, jo a job with us on the chat box. And I just want to be clear, <laughs> uh, you know, I posted an ad on LinkedIn and, and uh, again, I, I got some snipe, uh, some, you know, a, a bit sensitive remarks towards it. Uh, at Evident today, we're running pretty much at full capacity and we're expanding our design team. So I posted an ad on on LinkedIn as, as we are posting everywhere. And the reason we're running on full capacity is because most labs, uh, as the business ramps up, they're sending to us until they can employ a person full time. And really that's mm -hmm. the pattern that, that we're seeing today. And so, yeah, we, we are hiring, but I've made a commitment to all the, the uh, evident customers that if they're an evident customer or if, an employee of an evident customer applies for a job with us, we would have to get the okay from, from uh, the management team of 
what they were left at is to to hire them and then uh, we would return or offer the the employee the their original job back if uh, that that lab ramps up so it was our way of uh, trying to support the community when you know uh, there's a shortage of jobs so uh, anyway uh, I just wanted to be clear on that so I don't get more more hate mail on that on that regard uh, how do you compensate sales reps um, so for our sales reps I mean everyone's a little different but we mainly have a formula down where it's uh, they get a percent of it on a base um, wage and that's kind of in my opinion for calling on our existing customers as well because um, that's something we're asking them to do and then we incentivize them also on new doctor sales um, and we give them an incentive on any new doctor sales over about a five-year period and it's different percentage payouts based on the first year the doctor's new versus the fifth year um, but they usually have about a five-year window of getting paid on an account so you look at really a, a five-year lifespan on the main account? Yeah, and I think for us, I mean, the way we've always looked at it is after, in our industry, I feel that after so long, the doctors are really working with the internal group and the management team and the different department managers. And I mean, we have our reps then go check in on them and see how they're doing. But we've always kind of more incentivized looking for new business to grow. Yeah. Kind of, uh, we're more hunters than we are farmers. We let our internal management team farm, and we let our sales reps hunt. Yeah, and and time and time again, what I've seen in labs do is they'll they'll go, we want a rep. They'll hire someone, give them a bag, and say, here, go find me some doctors. You know? um, yeah, and I mean, I've seen talking. Like, here's your here's your area, and it's two hundred and fifty grand. Well, if it got up to 300, I mean, in reality, all they had to do is maintain business and bring on one good account. Yeah. So Where if you're just measuring new business, because I also don't want to hold my reps accountable for people that we lose. But sometimes we lose for stuff they can't control. Fair. So I'm like, okay, you lost the biggest account in there, and it's because I sent them two wrong partials. Well, now they can't hit their numbers, and it's nothing they can control. I think that's... To me, being that we make customized products, it's hard to hold your reps overly accountable for long-term customers. Yeah, yeah, that's the one thing about the lab business that uh, people outside the industry don't understand. In the lab business, we produce mass customized products. Yes. And that's why it's a tough business to be in because mass customization is tough. Yeah. you make mistakes yeah so very fair response uh, we've got uh, a few more questions here like how do you plan when when you go back uh, into production like how do you manage the team how do you space them how all of that stuff the new protocols in place have you thought through that stuff yeah, I mean, I'm, even right before this meeting, my HR was in here meeting with the people we brought back, going over some of our new guidelines and recommendations um, that we are going through as a company. Um, so we're providing each employee uh, face masks for each day. Um, we've also then have actually implemented over this time off, we're gonna implement geofencing so no one ever has to touch time clocks anymore. So that eliminates any touch. We're just looking at we have open door policy during this time. Doors can't be closed. That way they don't have to be opened. Um, so things like that, uh, masks to be worn anytime you're within six feet. Luckily with the two buildings right now, space isn't an issue. Uh, we're able to spread out well more than six feet away from each other. We have hand sanitizer for everybody. We have wipes at all the common areas and we're asking people to wipe before and after use. Um, and I mean, during this time we've been ordering as much PPE as we can get knowing that this was going to be a change. So I've been on auto orders from every company that I can possibly get supplied. I've never seen my biggest payable is going to be for stuff I haven't used, but it's okay. stuff we're going to need. Yeah. You know, to me, that's a, that's a, a great tip for labs is uh, before you open up, make sure you have what you need. What percentage of, of uh, business do, 
the audience think they were, that we're going to get back, you know? When the lights come back on, do you guys expect 25, 50, 75, or 100% of the business? Just curious, because I know it has an impact on how many people you bring back on. Yeah, and I think a lot of that's going to depend on what, where your location is. Um, for me, what I'm seeing just in talking to my customer base, when I get close to Chicago, not many are opening immediately. When I'm south of my lab, everybody's ready to open. And I think it's just the difference of, you know, down, you're in a county with 300,000 people with 30 cases versus downtown Chicago where it's a pandemic. So I do think based on where your patients come or where your clients are, are they in rural areas or are they in cities? That'll make a difference, in my opinion. I think we'll see a quicker scale up by our dentists that are in rural areas than we will for those that are in more suburban or city areas. Yeah, by the way, interesting response. So 25% uh, of work will come back. That's about a third of the viewers. 50%, that's you know another 20% of viewers. 75% of the work, another 16%. And 100% of the work, about a quarter of the viewers. I hope they're right. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. Uh, and again, you know, uh, because we have clients from all over, what we're seeing in the countries that have opened up is uh, it's running around 50% at best, you know, 60 days after. So yeah, if that, that's any indication. And I think part of that is just, I mean, kind of like, you know, uh, hair salons or restaurants. It's Sunday, you're taking uh, an area of space and you're cutting it in half because, you know, only half the tables are allowed, only half the, the seats are allowed in the hair salon. So things like that in a dental practice, especially in, in tight spaces, how you manage the inflow and outflow of people. It's going to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah? I agree. Yeah. Uh, last couple of questions, and, and Jim, you've been awesome. You've been very patient. So, Thank you. Uh, do you follow any philosophy, lean, agile, et cetera? You know, this is Brian uh, Matthews from London asking us this. Yeah, I've, we played around with lean and we've, I wouldn't say we're great at it. I mean, but we've definitely, when we put it in, we weren't looking at like going 100% lean, but it really helped us find where maybe we had bottlenecks. But just over the last two years, we did, um, we implemented the EOS system, which is an entrepreneur operating system in our company. Um, and it, what it really does is it, there's a book called uh, Traction. If anybody's read that, that kind of lets you know a little bit about it. And then there's a book called What the, the Heck is EOS? And we use it um, at our executive level, all the way into our management level, and then all of our department levels. And it really allows people to take on accountability. Um, that's about all the main purpose of it is. So everybody in our company has three main rocks, they call them, and that's quarterly. So we kind of are year now in quarters and everybody has what they need to be working on. And as a group, we get together within our departments and you know, your weekly meetings, you're reporting on where you're at with the rocks. There's also issue solving. So now anytime anybody's having an issue or having a hard time, maybe just with a project they're working on, they can bring their issues and the group um, can work on it collaboratively. Um, but it's really, a, really spiked our accountability and just our overall production on both Inter, like on the floor and the operations, but also on our administrative side too. Um, I think it's eliminated the, well, I didn't know that. Now everybody kind of knows what we're working on. We're very transparent as a company. I have quarterly meetings with the entire company um, where I get in front and just kind of report how we're doing on the financial side, what we're doing in sales and marketing. Um, and that really challenges us as a executive team. We give out our one year goals and our three year goals to the whole team. So that's how we hold ourselves as an executive team accountable as well. And you know, most of the time we're hitting our goals, but when we don't, I have to get up there and face the crowd and let them know why we didn't. Sometimes it's we made a decision to veer away, but other times it's we just didn't, we dropped the ball and it's something we need to work on. But I think the EOS system for us has been probably the, since I've been here, the biggest asset we've brought into our company that's helped not only myself, but I've seen so many other people grow within our organization. And you'll see, it really allows you to see who's 
working to work their way up the company and who, I mean, they will also show you who maybe is in the wrong seat. And it's a good Q and A for these systems. Uh, you know, I, at the end of this, this discussion, I want to do a final poll, which is if you guys want to see uh, a session dedicated to just going through maybe some basic systems, some models, you know, some budgeting and planning, we can schedule that uh, at the different time. Uh, what's this poll that's come up? Would you want Paula to? Okay, the, the, the team's asking here now if uh, they're volunteering me if we should do a, a separate session on some of the templates that we have because uh, we've got the history of, you know, 20 years of all of these models and templates that uh, we're happy to share with people if that's something you guys want to see. We can schedule a separate time for that. Uh, on this note, I know we've taken a lot of your time, uh, Jim. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I just got myself another job. Everyone wants to see you again. <laughs> um, thanks for your time. And uh, I know, uh, you know you're on an expansion plan. And after listening to you, certainly... If, if I had the lab in, in the areas that you're expanding in, I would definitely give you a ring because, you know, the logistics capabilities and systems thinking that you bring is very impressive. So thanks for right. Thank you. With us. And, Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, in the, stay positive. This too will pass. You know, let's get on with life. Absolutely. Take care. Right. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.